While I was in Florida, I visited my friend Gretchen. While talking to her, I realized how much I didn't know about the ocean. Hi, my name is Gretchen Arndt. Um, I'm currently a student at Florida Atlantic University studying biology. I'm also a volunteer at the Sea Turtle Preservation Soci Society for our Sunday morning walks. And I'm also a volunteer at the Sea Turtle Healing Center at the Brevard too. So in the morning, we get up really, really early, 5 a.m. for me. <laughs> Um, and then we head over to the beach. We usually get there about 6.15 a.m. before the sun completely rises. And we divide our groups into two. One end takes the south, one end takes the north. Um, we meet again in the middle. And there are volunteers. We, um, we evaluate the nest. We determine what species it is. We, um, we record data for FWC's future use so we can determine the populations of turtles and what their numbers are and if they're stable, if they're threatened. You know, that helps give us a little bit better of an idea of what's happening with these species. Okay, it looks like along over here that we've got, we might have a nest because we've got long tracks coming up and we've got a nice mound over here. The first thing we're gonna do is to check and see the ins and outs of the track so we know what we're looking at at the top and what kind of turtle that we're looking at. So by looking at her tracks, we know that she's gone out this way. So she would have come in up that path because if you look, there's a dig, a kick back here, kind of like if you were a runner and going, that you would have a dig at the back. We can also see that that was a longer track. So that would have been after the tide line today. So this is our exit for her. So we're gonna come up here then and see whether or not it's a false nest, a false crawl, or whether it's an actual nest. Some of the things that we look for is whether there's a deep ridge on this part, indicating she was ready to go out and doing her cut. We see that there's spray, so she's covered the nest really well. So this is indicating to us that we have a nest. And we have a body hit. Sometimes not all of these signs are really strong, um, we can have a smaller ridge here. We can have a little bit of spray and not as much that we see here. She did a really good job. And then we can see too her little tail path coming in. <laughs> she has. It looks like we've had someone with a dog visiting too. So then we come on around and we have to kind of ballpark where she, we think that she would have um, left her eggs. So we look to the last part where she's come in and we follow her tracks and we actually stand in them. And we look for a small mound. And we lean out. <laughs> it's really scientific. And so we kind of talk to the group about where we think it would be. Group? <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would say right around here would be about where the... So we're looking for a mound. We're looking for the end of her tracks. And then we'll make a little mark like this. And this is where we're going to begin our measurements. So then the next thing we have to do is we have to do um, a measurement to where we're going to put our stake in that marks it. So now starts paperwork because this is going to be a marked nest. We'll give it a number. We'll fill out the paperwork. We'll do all of the measurements for it. And then later, um, after hatching time, a few days later, we have a prescribed number of days. We'll come back in and we'll open up the nest and do a count. And the counts that we do on it are the uh, number of eggs that were in the nest, how many hatched, how many didn't hatch, and then also a count of how many babies, little baby turtles that we still have in the nest that we need to um, put outside so they can make their way to the ocean. So we have to mark the dates. And in a minute, Tom will give me the lot number and the zone number so we know exactly where we're located. We'll do a list of all the surveyors. Hold on. Then the next thing we have to do is we have to do um, a measurement to where we're going to put our stake in that marks it. And then we're going to do a measurement all the way out to the dune and we're going to put another stake out there so that if this one gets lost due to weather or somebody picking it up, that we have another reference we can measure back from later. Mm -hmm. Lisa's going back and doing the stake measurement. And then also from this measurement, we'll determine um, three feet back where we'll put the sign. 
So we have several sets of markers to know that where the sign is, that three feet out is the egg chamber, and then from the dune stake, we'll have the measurement on record if we need to come back. Plus, we'll also GPS it. And we also give a description of the building. So it's a five-story yellow building with a green metal roof. And then from her, her track, because she had an alternating path to the way that she made her flipper marks, we know that she is a loggerhead. So when we dig holes for any of the stakes, do we need the three foot mark again? You marked it, okay. We dig everything by hand, no implements at all. Um, any of the nest work that we do, we do all by hand. No tools, no stakes, no kitty shovels. And it also has to be deep enough that the stake won't fall over. We think it's tough digging down like this. She had to do this last night in the middle of the night. And, and it's amazing how they can take their flippers and carve out about the size of an oatmeal box. Just perfectly round and just scoop down in to be able to lay the eggs in there. And then if you ever got a chance to watch a video of how they do it, once they get done, they're just gently covering it up and patting it down. Covering up and patting it down. Which is just amazing that that big of an animal can be just so gentle with their nest. Good to go. And then the last thing we do is mark off the, the track so that the next team that comes through knows that it's already been counted. Walk all the way through. so much about how sea turtles are born, I met up with Dr. Ashlyn Spring to learn more about sea turtles and how we can help them. I'm Dr. Ashley Spring. I'm a biology professor at Eastern Florida State College. My undergraduate degree is from Syracuse University in biology and my master's and PhD are in marine biology from the Florida Institute of Technology. I teach a variety of biology courses as well as conduct research with my undergraduate students in a number of areas of biology, both in the Indian River Lagoon and other areas across the world. So it's important to figure out what chemicals you are using and make sure you're disposing of them properly. Contact your waste disposal company in your area because many things cannot be dumped down our drains. As we know, everything leads to the ocean, and so when you do dump chemicals down the sink, although you may be adding water and soap to them, they're going right into the oceans where they're going to affect our marine life. From a larger standpoint, you can also contact companies. You can also contact your government officials and discuss with them why specific chemicals should not be used. An easy way to help the environment, not only sea turtles but other organisms, is to avoid using plastic bags. Recycle, reduce, and reuse. So in the case of plastic bags, sea turtles like the loggerhead sea turtle who consume uh, jellies think that a floating plastic bag looks like a jelly. They'll swallow it and because their body can't break it down in their stomach, it remains inside the stomach. Sea turtle thinks it's full and eventually actually starves to death. So by using reusable bags when you go to the grocery store, now there are stores you can reduce the number of plastic bags that go into our landfills and our ocean. Thibropapilloma can be found in a tumor form on the sea turtles as large as about the size of a golf ball and even up to the size of a tennis ball. It's found in the soft tissue areas on sea turtles around their eyes, under their flippers, and it can have an effect not only having an annoying large tumor on the side of you, but can affect their sight if it's around their eyes, can affect their feeding when it's around their mouth, and even blocking their um, ability to swallow as it gets larger. And when around their fins, makes it more difficult to swim. 
It's found in about 50% of all green sea turtles in the Indian River Lagoon and about 25% of all sea turtles found in Florida, either on the brink of dying or dead, have the fibropapilloma. That's about double in green sea turtles found in the Indian River Lagoon. So why so much higher in the Indian River Lagoon? Pollution. The problem is in the Indian River Lagoon, being that it is a more contained area with less flushing of water and being close to human activities, we have a higher amount of pollution than in the Atlantic Ocean where currents will take those materials and spread them out to farther distances. So now we have a higher percentage of sea turtles with fibropapilloma, especially in the green sea turtles, we see the highest amount. Although fibropapilloma has been found in all species of sea turtles, with the exception of leatherbacks. And in the green sea turtles, they're exposed to human um, chemicals that we're releasing, like um, organochemicals, into the Indian River Lagoon, which won't directly harm them in terms of getting fibropapilloma, but does decrease their immune system's ability to fight off viruses and diseases. So, what can we do as individuals? To educate is the most important thing. Educate others about why we should not be releasing harmful chemicals and pollutants into our waterways. Protect our sea turtles.